Greetings, neighbors. This is Reflections, a religious affairs program sponsored by the Paducah Cooperative Ministry, where we, all of us together, do God's work with human hands. My name is Gregory Waldrop, and I'm the pastor at Fountain Avenue United Methodist Church, and I'm one of your co-hosts for this show. I'm joined by Karen Winkle, the pastor at United, uh, United Church of Paducah. Welcome, Karen. Good to see you, Gregory, and good to have you with us. We're here today with... Uh, David Comperi, who's the pastor at Broadway United Methodist here in Paducah, to uh, study together Psalm 110. And the psalms that we're studying together this year are ones that are featured in a book by Eugene Peterson mm -hmm. called Where Your Treasure Is. And they're, I think, a collection of psalms that probably um, uh, most faithful people are less familiar yes. with. Not, not that we're most. studying psalms mm -hmm. that really don't speak so much to our individual experience as our collective experience. They're psalms that kind of point us uh, outward into the world. That would be, I think, a fair way of saying mm -hmm. it. So, um, so if this is a psalm that's not familiar to you, that's to be expected and all the more reason to study it together and see what... Uh, um, fruits of faith we can uh, find here. So I'll be reading the psalm um, from my Bible, which is the New Revised Standard Version. And I think, David, you've got a different version, which will help add a little bit of dimension. Um, right. This is the English Standard Version, mm -hmm. a, a pretty new translation uh, that follows a little bit after the uh, New International Version, mm -hmm. probably more than uh, the New Revised Standard or some of the other English, New English Bible or any of the, the others that uh, have come out in recent years. Mm -hmm. And you've got the New Revised Standard? Is I that, have hmm? the Revised Standard, okay. but I have the Red Letter Edition. Okay, so that's all right. <laughs> Anyway, the words will be on <laughs> the screen. How many red letters are there in this song? There's not many in this song. <laughs> okay. yeah. not, not to worry. The words will be on the, uh, the screen as I read. So this is Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends out from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your foes. Your people will offer themselves willingly on the day you lead your forces on the holy mountains. From the womb of the morning, like dew, your youth will come to you. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter heads over the wide earth. He will drink from the stream by the path. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, as I said, this is one of those psalms that probably most of us uh, don't turn to or even maybe turn away from. It's one of those psalms that um, seems um, in some ways um, at odds with um, a God of, of gentleness and grace. It um, has images that are uh, violent and wrath-filled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's also a psalm that seems to be aimed at um, reassuring somebody who's in a position of power. And my guess is that none of the three of us here exactly feel like the head of state. Uh, even though we're pastors of a church, we know that uh, powerlessness is more the norm for most of the people we work with and more of our own experience than to have a sense of this awesome ability to shape a nation. 
And uh, all of the psalms that have to do with kings are a little bit harder to swallow, I think, because of that. Uh, they speak of uh, having enemies at your footstools, and uh, we just sort of want to be protected from our enemies, not necessarily vanquish them. So uh, I think that adds to the strangeness of this psalm as well. It uh, just doesn't connect with where we ordinarily think we would be in the course of our normal week. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's interesting. Uh, we, as we tape this, we're in the election season, and mm -hmm. whether it's the election season or not, we all sort of know that dynamic. And uh, I'm, I hear in this uh, some of the mystery of of leadership being uh, highlighted. I hear in here, uh, as you say, it, it's written to to the obviously it seems to the leader of the nation, uh, and, and it's written to sort of say it's mysterious why sometimes people follow you willingly and powerfully, or sometimes your enemies, uh, you know, give way, the most difficult enemies seem to give way the easiest. It's, it's mysterious just how those things are turned and how that happens. And I, I heard a political commentator this week saying almost the same thing. It's absolutely mysterious how an electorate is turned on one image or another or what mm -hmm. small little detail seems to have uh, pushed the, the election in one direction or the other. And uh, in some ways, what I hear in this, uh, and you know, you do have to get around the violence there somewhat, but I hear in here this, this reminder, even to the most powerful, that it is God who has things. It is God who holds things in God's hands. It, it is not uh, the election or the electorate or the elected one or the king who ultimately has the last say about the way things turn out, the way life transpires. It really is God who, who uh, is the main actor, and I think that's mm -hmm. the, the reality of the mm -hmm. 110. God is the one setting things in motion. He's the main actor, and he is in control, and because of that, there's also a fresh opportunity, an unexpected opening in the midst of things that uh, seem to be rather frightening or overwhelming, this business of... Uh, of coming from the womb of the morning, the dew of your youth will be yours. That's, that's such an encouraging thing to think that each morning is, is giving birth to a new opportunity, a, a reinvigoration of our lives, uh, a regaining of that youth that seems to be lost. Uh, I'm uh, being older than both of you. I, I'm, I'm really grateful for those days when I, I feel pepped up and energized, when I, I believe indeed I can tackle what's before me that day. And it's a great feeling to know that even when I begin to flag a little bit and fatigue sets in, I'm not operating just out of my own strength yeah. that God provides. Yeah. And I've got to believe that those who are in true positions of power, authority, and responsibility have to draw from something like this or they will fall flat on their faces and mm -hmm. they will discover a sense of helplessness yeah. in the face of all the stuff that you have to deal with. And how is it Paul said it in Corinthians, though our outer nature wasteth away, mm -hmm. our inner nature is being renewed day by day and this affliction which is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight and glory. So that's a good scenario. That's a wonderful, mm -hmm wonderful illusion there. And Jesus himself, you know, at the times. Uh, what I love about Jesus is uh, I truly believe he is the Son of God and, and, and fully divine as well as fully human. I don't understand that, but I believe it. But the great thing about it is that he had to find those times of refreshment. Mm. He ran out of steam himself and was exhausted. And yet, every time he was, it seemed like the new demand that came upon him. He met with a freshness and a, and a vitality that, that didn't uh, just say, well, let me get past this so I can go off and rest. 
he was actually renewed in the fresh challenge of each morning. Mm -hmm. And I think it was because he knew he was operating not out of his own mm -hmm. strength alone, but out of the strength of his heavenly Father, mm -hmm. who, <laughs> who does not sleep, who never lets the sun shine, set on his, uh, on his care that uh, even the, uh, the little bird that falls from the heavens is, away, is, is covered mm -hmm. by God's grace and God's provision for him. So it's, it's you know, I, it, it is not one of those psalms. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I've never preached a sermon from mm -hmm. this. I'm pretty sure I've never just done a, uh, an expanded study of this psalm, but it really does have some neat, some neat mm -hmm. passages. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that is the heart of it, God's strength and provision. It's not just his power, but it's also his caring provision that, uh, that the king or the servant can draw from yeah. and rely upon. Uh, well, I'm always intrigued by that allusion in, anywhere biblically, but that priest in the order of Melchizedek. Oh, yes, sir. Barry, that fellow that shows up sort of un, in the mysterious ways to Abraham, and and then finds his way even in through the New Testament as yeah. well. To, um, and I'm I'm interested. I'm I wonder what this illusion. What what do you think this illusion includes? Well, of course, Melchizedek is one of those, and I like the word you use, mystery. He just sort of appears. Uh, he, he appears back there in Genesis uh, actually having a wonderful encounter with Abram at the time when Abram is, is riding high. Abram has just won a great victory over his enemies. He's rescued his, his nephew Lot and, and his family from captivity. And he comes back to Salem and the king, Melchizedek, who's also a priest, uh, comes out to meet him and brings... Of course, as a Christian, I, I always notice things where he brings bread and wine as an offering, which to us would say it's more than just a little bit of refreshment. It's mm. an offering of oneself. Yeah. And then Abram's response to him is just as wonderful. I mean, he's been dealing with kings. He just won a battle over kings. And yet he offers this king a tithe of all that he has. Um, and, and refuses to take the spoils of war without at least offering them mm -hmm. to this king. It, it's a neat thing. And I understand, I think, very little about this, but I do understand enough that I can kind of sense that the writer of Hebrews in wanting to tell us how Jesus was this unique high priest uh, picked on Melchizedek and said that Jesus was of the order of Melchizedek, a priest after that order, which means that he wasn't like all the other priests. All of the priests who uh, are of, of the, the line of the traditional covenantal mosaic setup, mm -hmm. uh, no longer is he one of the, the Aaron boys, no, no longer is he of the line of Levi, but uh, Jesus is this unique uh, and because he's unique, he's also able to do unique things that no other priest can do that actually transform life instead of just sort of keep it going. Right, maintain. Um, so, I, you know, this, this to me is a real promise uh, that, that the king that comes who is supported by God's purposes has a uniqueness. And it's not just about, hey, uh, my granddaddy was king, that makes me a king but it's rather I have a role to play that is a part of God's plan. Right. Melchizedek gives a content to this. Yeah, very this much so. priesthood, doesn't it? This kingship. Mm. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's a content of righteousness and God's purpose rather than of uh, special prerogatives or personal privilege. Mm -hmm. um, I, never having been a king myself, I have no idea but I imagine the great struggle most kings face, as most presidents, as most people of, of great wealth and power face, is, is how, do I, how do I live out the unique opportunities this 
privilege gives me? Mm -hmm. How do I exercise this special gift that has been given to me uh, in a way that, that makes it worthwhile, not just for me, but for the world right. and certainly for God's purposes? Mm -hmm. And I think anybody in positions of power who forgets that ultimately that power is not for personal privilege, but is for responsible exercise mm -hmm. is a person who's lost his way or her way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what you're describing, I think, is the, you know, the, the servant leader as opposed to exactly. um, someone who, I mean, I don't think there is any time when there haven't been leaders who were interested in advancing their own um, cause and, and enriching the coffers of themselves mm -hmm. and their um, cronies, if, if you will. And I think what you're describing is, is really the rarer uh, leader. And I think, um, you know, in, the, in, in my lifetime, I can't really think of all that many that would, that would fit into that category. Um, and well, the, I'm <clears throat> just a casual glance ac across the 20th century, there are four or five people that the world has recognized as such. Uh, people like Gandhi, uh, people like Martin Luther King Jr., uh, people like uh, more recently um, uh, like Valenza and mm -hmm. or Nelson, Nelson Mandela, Mandela. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, who have spent considerable amounts of time in prison even as a, sort of the way to, uh, uh, to start their surge to the top from, the, from prison. And uh, so those, those are the people that kind of come to mind and heart. And they are exceptional. They are exceptional, and their positions and their power came out of their purpose and their, their struggle with uh, whatever challenges they faced in terms of injustice, in terms of the, the needs of humanity. Uh, I would add Mother Teresa to your mm -hmm, list, mm -hmm. even though she never exercised any kind of power in terms of politics or anything else, she was an enormous influence. She was. She is. And, and I like to use the term influence more than power, I mm -hmm. think, because I, I do believe that power does indeed tend to corrupt, uh, tend to become a, a, uh, an enemy of itself uh, all too quickly. But servanthood does not. And the, the Mother Teresas and the Nelson Mandelas, who are servants of a greater thing, and who sacrifice themselves willingly for that greater purpose, I think, are the ones who ultimately, ultimately can understand what the Order of Melchizedek is all about. Because in a sense, they, they are doing that. It, comes, it doesn't come out of nowhere, but it comes out of no human prerogatives and no special privilege. It comes out of an awesome commitment to a responsibility, a task, or a great cause that lifts a person out of himself or out of herself. And I, I would hope that, that maybe David or whoever this psalm was intended for understood that rather than, and sat upon the throne differently uh, because of that understanding. Yeah. You know, the, uh, uh, what little Hebrew I have retained uh, is, is around Melchizedek. This uh, Melchi being king, Zadok or Zadok being righteousness, mm -hmm. the notion of righteousness, uh, and for, um, uh, for biblical people in the Judeo-Christian tradition particularly, this notion of righteousness is such an important one. It's such a recurring theme all the way through. Um, in this instance, again, a reminder of how much different God's righteousness is than a human mm. righteousness, uh, how much uh, how differently focused is this righteousness of God. And uh, again, it, uh, it has its, its beginnings 
here in the uh, Hebrew Scriptures, and Jesus picks it up and lives it out in powerful ways as well. Mm -hmm. uh, what, 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 any thoughts about righteousness at this passage? Oh, I think righteousness is, is very much a center of what we were talking about because the, the righteousness of God can only be understood in terms of a fidelity to the way God intends things to be, to, to the perfect will of God, if you, if you would. Uh, not God's circumstantial will, not the, the, the immediate issues but the, that we face in the struggles where humans have to make compromises, but the absolute integrity and focus upon God's absolute purposes. Yeah. I think, I don't, I don't know, even know as much Hebrew as you do probably, but, um, but I do remember that Salem is where Melchizedek was king, right. and Salem means peace. Mm. It, is, it is a case that this righteousness is the source of peace. Mm. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, I think back to Jesus in the upper room, uh, talking about uh, all of the things in, in the, the John narrative where he talks about love one another, sending a Holy Spirit, uh, being a sacrifice and all. But where he also said, peace I leave with you. Mm -hmm. My legacy to you is peace. And I think this righteousness is the only way to find that kind of peace. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Nelson Mandela. I don't know how you find peace in a prison, but he did. And if you look at the serenity of the man as he was released, it wasn't like a bird out of a cage. It was like a person whose inner struggle has been validated by God and by the world. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's, that's real power. Mm -hmm. That's real righteousness. Mm -hmm. That ability to be so faithful to, to the greatness of God's purpose that mm -hmm. you... Uh, you need the swerve to the left and to the right even when it's a sacrifice. Yeah. Well, to kind of connect with this, the, there's an interesting um, uh, phrase here, the first half of verse 6. It says, He will execute judgment among the nations. And I think we can't understand that phrase really without this conversation mm -hmm. about, you know, what lies at the heart of of God's vision for us, God's purpose for us, God's dream for us in terms of the ways that we will live, what will govern our hearts, what will really um, be our, um, you know, what will we'll drive our decisions and, right. and ha be our priorities in the world. I remember in, in uh, my denomination, we have a statement of faith that includes a line similar to this that you know there that God will um, judge not only individuals but nations and I remember a parishioner who um, grew up largely unchurched was just outraged by that thought that God would judge nations well what do you mean God's going to judge nations and I, that for me was just a little glimpse into his identity which was that that he he really wasn't part of anything greater. I don't I don't think. I mean, I'm I'm sure he took pride in in being an American. But I think his idea of faith was that it was really all about his relationship with God, and that he, and that he was over, doing yeah. good things in his world, but not that he was participating in a society that might or might not reflect God's um, vision and God's um, purposes. Yeah, I, I do think uh, that in our individualistic society, we do forget how much of our fate and how much of our lives are bound up with one another and with indeed the, uh, the legacy of nations, of cultures. Uh, it's inescapable. We are Americans. Uh, we're at a point of exercising our civic responsibility as Americans at the ballot. Uh, I don't know when this will air, but t tomorrow is election day. And in a sense, we are, by our participation in the political process of our nation, um, I hope as Christians, saying more uh, as, as religious people who, who look 
to God as the God of the cosmos, not right. just the God of my individual heart, uh, that we are, are making a statement that we exercise our faith not by withdrawing from society, not by pulling apart from uh, the world, but by immersing ourselves as carriers of faith into injecting ourselves into the world. Now, it's not a controlling thing because uh, what I found is that when Christians try to run government, they tend to make a mess of government and their faith. I mean, we're, we're not real good and our church history is not real good at being able to say that uh, uh, the better church person you are, the more likely you are to be a good governor of anything. Uh, that's, we, we don't have that good heritage there. But I do think we have a heritage that goes way back into our Hebrew roots and into Psalms like this that say that, that we are inextricably bound up with the world in which we live. And we are working with a God whose desire is the redemption of the entire world and the redemption of society. Mm -hmm. uh, and as imperfect as we are in our culture and in our world, uh, it is the arena in which we are to find and to help promote God's righteousness. Right, right. It's not something we just withdraw and uh, even monastic people, I think, understand that their withdrawal from the word is to help transform mm -hmm. the world, not to separate themselves from sources of pollution, mm -hmm. but to help them become better equipped to reduce the pollution yeah. of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Last comments here. We're at the. You know what you said, Karen, earlier about not being familiar. The great thing about the Psalms is that they are an area of Scripture you can study and find everything to challenge you and to deepen your faith. And even though they're not specifically Christian. Uh, as we bring our Christian theology into it, we find so much there to challenge us and to help us grow. Yeah. And I'm, I think it's great that you all are, are uh, going through and looking at these psalms in a fresh way. And I thank you for the privilege of sharing with you in it. Oh, and thank Thanks you yes. for the, the richness that you brought to the conversation. Thank you, f and thank you for... Uh, your ministry in Paducah. And, well, uh, thank and you for the privilege behalf. of sharing yeah. with you two guys. Yeah. Appreciate it so much. Yeah, it's been good to be together yeah. and good that you're with us. Thank you for joining us here at Reflections. Please, um, however you can, whenever you can, join Paducah Cooperative Ministry in doing God's work with your human hands. Shalom. Shalom.